We'll continue talking about economic growth in chapter 8 with lecture number 3. And now we want to look at some of the empirics. We want to take this model really to the data and see do the basic predictions that this model has, do they cohere with the data? Do they, do they match up with the data? Or do they ba does it basically just come out to be kind of a silly model? So the first thing that we see is that the solo growth model exhibits what we called balanced growth amongst many variables. Okay, this is kind of an important concept. Um, I'm not a growth theory guy, so it's a little bit lost on me, but it really is an important concept. In fact, we use this idea of balanced growth sometimes to solve a little more complicated problem. So sometimes the problem is, it's not in this case, but sometimes we get these growth models that are so complicated, we need kind of a, a way to cheat in order to solve them. And one of the ways we do that is through this idea of a balanced growth path. We're talking about balanced growth. But basically, what does that mean? That means variables grow at the same rate. So, for example, the solo growth model predicts that output per worker and capital per worker will grow at the same rate, namely rate G. Now, we showed that in the previous lecture. Output per worker is going to grow at rate G. Why don't you, on your own, try to figure out how to prove that capital will grow at rate G. And so the, the um, ratio of capital to output, or in some ways you could think of this if you flipped it around and output divided by capital, the average product of capital remains constant. And actually, this seems to be a fairly close prediction to the data we see in the real world. The SOTO growth model also predicts that the real wage will grow at the same rate as Y over L. Well, and while real rental price is constant, well, we see that this stays fairly close to what the data has to say from the real world as well. So we've got two nice predictions that are coming out of the solo growth model. They seem to fit with the data. This is good. So the next concept, though, that we have to deal with is something called convergence. OK, so well, what am I talking about here? Well, solo growth model picks that other things being equal, poor countries should grow faster than rich ones. Why is this? Well, if you're a poor country, what happens? That means you're, you have capital that's below the steady state level of capital. You don't have enough capital per worker which means the marginal product of investment, all right, the return to investment, all right, so the marginal product of capital is high. And so since it's higher in this um, small country that's poor, you're going to want to invest there. And so they're going to have much more investment. When they have more investment, what happens? They have, end up with more capital per worker, which causes their output per worker to grow fast. And so eventually catch up the large countries or the, the developed economies that are at their steady state, which are growing at a much more slow rate. Okay? Well, great. We've got that. Um, but does it actually happen? Well, if this were true, then the income gap between rich and poor countries would shrink over time, causing standards of living to converge. That's what we mean by convergence, right? So, well, all the poor countries in the world would grow fast, and so they'd eventually catch up to the United States, and basically everybody would eventually live at the same standard of living that we see in the United States, right? Uh, well, it'd be nice, but unfortunately it doesn't quite work that way. In the world, real world, we have countries, we have economies that are permanently underdeveloped. All right, so I like to think of spreading up the economies in the kind of three broad categories. It's not exactly correct, and I'm sure somebody will argue with me, but it helps me think about it. Number one, underdeveloped countries. These are our underdeveloped economies. These are economies that are poor, they're staying poor, and they're not getting any better. Developing economies. These are economies that are they're poor, but they're getting better. All right, things are improving. And then finally, developed countries. So developed countries are countries that are essentially the rich countries of the world. They are operating at a steady state very close to their golden rule, steady state.
Okay, so examples of this might be underdeveloped. You could see countries in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, developing countries, you might see countries like, for example, China is definitely a developing country. Um, they, they have some problems still, but they're, they're working through those. Um, then you have the United States, which is a developed economy. Uh, but there's nothing that's going to necessarily make these underdeveloped economies become developing and then eventually become developed economies. Sometimes they just stay permanently stuck in that underdeveloped stage. So, well, why? Um, and is this a real problem for the solo growth model? Because if the solo growth model predicts convergence and we don't have convergence, that seems to me to be a pretty big miss. But the thing is, the solo growth model doesn't really predict convergence or what we should refer to as absolute convergence, that all countries will eventually converge to the same steady state. What it, pre what it predicts in reality is something called um, conditional convergence. And the gotcha here is other things remaining equal. All right, all other things equal. Well, things are not equal. All right, so countries don't have the same savings rate. They don't have the same population growth rate. They don't have the same technological development rate. There's a host of factors that are different about the U.S. economy as opposed to an economy from sub-Saharan Africa. If we really want to dig into that, I mean, the state of the art is thinking about, well, what are the economic institutions or the formal and informal rules that govern how the economy operates that are right in the developed economy, that are wrong in the underdeveloped economy, that are preventing the underdeveloped economy from improving. All right? There's just stuff isn't equal. And so what conditional convergence says is that, well, if we account for the things that are different, all right, so if we look at different savings rates, if we look at different population growth rates, things like human capital, all of this stuff, if we account for that, then we'll converge, right? In other words, an easier way of saying that is each individual country is going to converge to its own steady state dependent upon all of these factors that determine the steady state. All right, so the real prediction is conditional convergence. Countries converge to their own steady state, which are determined by, at least in our current solo growth model, savings, population growth, and education. All right, technological advancement. So that G, that could also be tech education, so improvement in skills, right? That's a part of technological advancement. Um, and this prediction does come true. Um, Differences in per capita income amongst countries can be due to lots of things, but in particular they can due to capital, physical or human per worker, and the efficiency of production, i.e. that's this height of the production function. How much can we make with this amount of resources? And let's face it, some economies can make more with resources than others, and right? some are more productive than others. So studies show that both of these factors are important, that both productivity or efficiency of labor um, is important, and the amount of capital, both physical and human capital per worker that we have, all very important. And the two factors are highly correlated with one another. Countries with high amounts of physical and human capital tend to be very highly productive or very efficient economies. And it makes sense, doesn't it? If I have better tools, I can be more efficient. Sure. I mean, just think of anything that you do, right? If you have a hobby, um, say you like to ride a bike. Well, when are you going to be able to ride a bike better? When you have a really nice bike that's kind of light and works well, or if you have a cheap bike from Walmart that weighs 10,000 pounds, right? You're going to be much faster on that really nice, good road bike that's a little more expensive and just a little better capital, right? It's the same thing throughout the whole economy. So some of the possible explanations for this, we've talked about this a bit, but productive efficiency encourages capital accumulation. If we're more efficient, then what happens? Well, the marginal product of capital goes up, the marginal product of capital goes up, the return to buying capital goes up, and so we want to buy more capital. Um, capital accumulation has externalities that raise efficiency, yes, um, and 
A third unknown variable causes capital accumulation and efficiency to be higher in some countries than in others. We kind of talk about this being this, there's sometimes there's these unobserved factors, or you think of it as like this X factor, something we don't know about. But it just works better in this economy than it does in that economy. Next question we have, what about openness? Right, what about, um, we've, we've talked about closed economies so far, uh, but what if we had free trade? What does that do? Well, lots of economists, studies from, well, beginning with Adam Smith, have really argued that the more free we can trade, the more inter-exchange there is between cultures and economies, the more productive. And it makes a little bit of sense. There's a, there's a couple of things that are going on here. The first thing that's going on here is that competition breeds efficiency. So if you're competing against other people, well, those competitors keep you lean. You know, they keep you, um, you know, really at your top form. You can't get lazy if somebody else is willing to, is, is ready to swoop in and take your business. The next thing is it opens up the market to new ideas, to new ways of doing things, to just a host of different technological innovations that happen in different spots. Right? So um, maybe uh, the, the people in um, Great Britain figured out one way to do it. Maybe the people in the United States figured out another way to do it. And we come together and we realize, well, if we trade, uh, you know, guess what? I can learn a little bit from you. You can learn a little bit from me. And we can find a better way to do it overall. Uh, so if we take a look at just, just some um, data on this, developed nations, if you see opened economy versus closed economy, massive difference in growth rates. So 2.3% growth in an open economy, less than 1% in the um, closed. In developing nations, it's even bigger when we look at 4.5% increase in developing nations versus the same 0.7% increase in um, closed economies. When you close your economy off, you close your off, yourself off to the resources of the world, and it makes you much less productive.